All right, Dre, kick us off. All right. Well, I guess, you know, to get started with things, unfortunately, today we're going to start off with it being sort of a more somber episode. But as everybody already knows, you know, Kobe Bryant this week had passed away and he's really been, you know, sort of that icon for everybody around the sports world, not even just basketball, not just the Lakers, but he truly meant a ton of things to, to the sports world and just his tenacity, his mentality and Everybody sort of talks about that mama mentality, you know, of, oh, you know, he's got the mama mentality because he's doing great things. But truly, the mama mentality to the sports world has been basically the ultimate badass mentality. The, it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter how hurt I am. I'm going to keep playing. And, and Kobe Bryant, you know, was an icon, not just here in the United States even, but China. I think him and Yao Ming were really the start to the Chinese sort of NBA era. And and Yao Ming, it's obvious, right? Like he was a Chinese basketball player that was outstanding, you know, a, a really great talent. But Kobe Bryant was just so good and so amazing and so influential that the Chinese couldn't help but love watching this dude play, right? Compared to, you got LeBrons nowadays and Anthony Davises. And so Kobe Bryant has, has just been that icon. And I think, like I said, going back to what he means to sports in general, the mentality that he has, right, that tenacity if you can give that to any athlete I guarantee that they're one of the best athletes in whatever given sport that they that they're in right Kobe Bryant would wake up at 5 30 in the morning just to go shoot around right when everybody else was still sleeping or there's stories where he would take two weeks off after his NBA finals games just to relax spend time with his family and then tell him hey I got to get back to work right and, you know, you and I, Juju, we're, we're going to get into this a little bit later when we've, we've got our top Kobe moments. But just the fact that he had torn his Achilles, right? I can't remember in what season it was uh, exactly. But he had torn his Achilles and still to say, hey, I don't need help. I'm going to make it to the free throw line just in case I can come back in this game. And I'm still going to shoot my two free throws. I'm still going to make it, right? And then I'm going to walk off the court on my own because I don't need anybody else's help. That, to me, is just the epitome of being the ultimate competitor, being literally that ultimate badass. Like, there's not a better word for, for Kobe Bryant. So it's definitely hit me hard being a Lakers fan, you know, growing up watching him. He was my favorite player, right? Like, he influenced an entire generation that every time we throw something away, we yell his name, right? It's, you don't yell Michael Jordan. You don't yell LeBron. You don't yell Shaq. You don't yell any other name. What you yell is Kobe, right, as, as you put up that shot. So, uh, you know, I, it hurts for his family and his daughter as well, right, Gigi? I've been telling everybody that Gigi, to me, was literally the 13-year-old embodiment of a female Kobe Bryant. And in my opinion, what makes this even more sad is that I had thought Gigi Bryant, right, was going to be the sort of catalyst that we needed to get eyes on the WNBA. Just because she already had gone viral at the age of 11 or 12, right? And she had that personality, that smile, but also the skills and the technique that Kobe Bryant instilled in her to make her an elite level basketball player, regardless of her gender, right? And, and so had she gone into UConn as the school that she had wanted to, and then got into the WNBA, I really think that would have been the catalyst for getting eyes on the WNBA and getting them more views. Like I would have tuned into WNBA primetime games just to watch, you know, Gigi play just to see, oh, what's the daughter of Kobe Bryant got? And, and so unfortunately, you know, the world has lost one an already developed icon and legend in Kobe Bryant, and two possibly on her way to becoming a sports legend with Gigi, and then of course all the other families involved. Yeah, so I mean, everyone already knows the headline. This wasn't just a sports headline. This was a culture icon moment. Like, no matter if you watch the NBA, casual viewer, whatever, you knew about this headline. You knew who passed away because Kobe Bryant was more than just a basketball player. He had literally won an Academy Award this past year for short film. He had been in the public eye for almost close to what, 30 years now at this point. Mm -hmm. got drafted at age 17. And it's just crazy that someone so young, you know, still in his 40s, passed away. Like, I think why a lot of people are feeling this one a little bit more than just your average celebrity death is because with someone like a Stan Lee, I mean, Stan Lee lived a long, 
wonderful lie. And, you know, he was coming towards the end, but like this one just came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. I remember scrolling through Twitter that morning and just thinking, okay, this is fake headline, especially too, because we talked about it a little bit, but LeBron had just passed him on the all-time scoring list the night before. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, someone's trying to be cute and say like, Kobe's legacy is dead. Ha ha. But then as I'm reading through, this is a real headline. And just to get more in the headline, there was nine people on board. Kobe Bryant was literally taking his daughter, Gigi, some of the assistant coaches, another family, and one of Gigi's teammates to a basketball camp. And unfortunately, just things went wrong. And they're still trying to determine causes to crash, everything like that. That still is yet to officially come out. But Mm -hmm. basically, you know, the pilot, a couple of assistant coaches, a whole family, the Antonelli family, all gone, their 13-year-old daughter. It's one of the most horrific incidents I think I've ever seen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And it's tough. And, uh, you know, like, Seeing Kobe from the other side, so I'm a Celtics fan, full disclosure, you know. Mm -hmm. As a player, I hated seeing Kobe Bryant on the other side. That guy was so good. (laughs) Took away the Celtics' second championship appearance in that little three-year period with the big three, and of course I was going to hold it against him. But Mm -hmm. now that I look in the age of load management and see all these players taking games off, you talk about that mama mentality, like be on the court, be there for your teammate, be there for those fans. That's what Kobe was all about. And I appreciate that more and more and more as we see players taking games off mm-hmm. and just taking plays off. I think that just goes counterintuitive to everything Kobe stood for. And I agree with what you're saying about Gigi there. I would have loved to see her and Gino Ariema team up at UConn. That would have been amazing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you want to talk about someone that could have been a trend center, a trailblazer for the WNBA. I think that would have been an outstanding catalyst. Yeah, absolutely. I literally think she would have been really the first because there's not a whole lot of guys that'll buy a woman's jersey, right? Like I, I just personally haven't seen it, right? I'm sure that there are, right? There are some guys that will follow closely women's sports or whatever. But I really think that Gigi's jerseys, right? Had she gone into the league, probably would have been the first that even guys would have been like, hell yeah, I'll buy, I'll buy that jersey, right? And I'll, I'll wear that proudly, right? Just because you got, she's related to Kobe Bryant. We got to see her sort of grow up and we knew how much time Kobe was investing in her. And she was literally like a mini version of, of the mama, right? She'd chew on her jersey just like Kobe would. Her handles were just as good as Kobe's. And her shot was for a 13 year old, just as good as Kobe's, right? Like it was insane. So it, it's incredibly sad. And I have heard, right, like it was really foggy in the area that morning. and A lot of helicopters were grounded that day. What I really hope doesn't happen is like a lot of people blaming the pilot for it, right? Like he died too or she died too. I'm pretty sure it was a he. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I, I hope that that isn't what happens. And I hope it really is just a, hey, let's, let's memorialize Kobe. The other thing I want to say too is, you know, when it comes to that mama mentality, like you're saying, like always wanting to get on the court. The other thing that I, I, you know, now looking back on Kobe that I really appreciate as much crap as he always got for like jacking up shots, right? Like, cause there were times where he was off and, you know, in the NBA, now you always hear people saying, well, if you're, if your shot's not falling, you better stop shooting, right? Like, and we always give players crap for that. But the fact that Kobe was willing to say that, hey, my shot's not falling, but I know I'm still the best player out here and I know I'm going to keep going. And I'm going to keep shooting. Like, even if I miss a thousand times, I'm going to make, I'm going to make the next one. And to me, that's, that's valuable. And in, in not only an NBA player, but any type of, of athlete, right? Of the fact that even if it's not going tonight, I've got to do what I've got to do to get something to go. And if it means I've got to take 50 more shots, then I'm going to take 50 more shots, right? And it might not be the most efficient as much as we like analytics and efficiency today. But the fact like that, it's like, hey, you know, I'm not going to beat myself up because we've seen time and time again where there's players nowadays that they miss their first two three-pointers and then they go cold the rest of the game and they, they sort of disappear and stand in a corner. The fact that Kobe was like, nope. I'll get it going on defense. I'll keep shooting. I'll find a way to make things work. Like to me, that's just a rarity that not a whole lot of athletes have that anymore. And, you know, it's definitely going to be something that's missed in the world. Oh yeah. I'm going to still call on Calher term here. When when you talk about analytics, manalytics, Kobe Bryant taking those shots, even like if they weren't falling, just continue to jack him up and try and carry his team, I think is the ultimate definition of manalytics. When you compare him to those Suns teams in those mid 2000s, who were so based on analytics, so based on like the, you know, what is it, 30 second or less offense that Dan Tony ran. And mm-hmm. let's face it, Kobe was dominating those teams for years. 
so much that D'Antoni eventually ran out of time and Phoenix and Steve Nash left to, well, go ruin your guys' team for a little bit there, contractually. <laughs> but, yeah. but I always appreciate that, Kobe. I mean, it's so crazy. You mentioned again this relationship he had with Gigi. To see those two like bonding over the game of basketball is just what is so heartbreaking about this. Mm-hmm. Like that video that went viral of him like teaching her the game while they were watching like the Nets and Lakers play that one night and hearing like articles of him buying League Pass, not for himself. He bought League Pass mm-hmm. just to bond with her and appreciate the game more. Like that's like amazing like dadness. <laughs> I don't know what yeah. else though. It's something they'll appreciate. And like when we cross that bridge and like have kids, that's the type of relationship I want to instill in my my kids, you know? Mm-hmm. bonding over something we both love whether it's basketball baseball hell maybe they don't even like sports screw it we'll find something yeah and that and that to me also just shows how good of a, a person right that he was developing into and i'm not saying that he was a bad person while he was playing but the fact that hey i'm going to transition my life like i did i did what i had to do while you know i had my playing career and now i've got to become a great dad he uh he did you know the uh the basketball short film that he won that Oscar for. It's a transition from, hey, I'm being a player to now I'm going to influence the game in other ways. There was even stories of his investing, right? Like, so he'd become a great investor. He invested in body armor back when that was just starting up. And I can remember my first body armor that I had. It was actually at like a mud run, one of those, one of those like the Dirty Dash or something like that. And it was this brand new sports drink. And the first iterations were, they were okay. I was like, yeah, you know, I don't know if I, if I, if I drink it regularly. And then, you know, Kobe was, was willing to invest and put a bunch of money in it. And then, you know, after that, he was able to turn around that investment. I think he had gained something. I want to, I, I'm going to be off on these numbers, but he had turned like a $2 million investment into like either a 50 million or a hundred million dollar payback. Right. Like, so Kobe was doing things beyond just like, Hey, I, I was a great player. And now he's becoming a great father. Like you said, he's doing stuff with his family, specifically for his daughter, right? Like, I will buy NBA League Pass, not for me, but for you. And I will watch games, not for me, because I enjoy the game, but so I can help you become the player that you want to be. He was coaching his daughter's basketball team, right? Like, dropping her off at school. I had heard that there are even times where, you know, when he would help players out or they'd get workouts in, he would schedule it so that it was either before he had to run and take his daughters to school in the morning. So that's why you had to be up at 5.30 if you wanted to work out with Kobe between the times when they were at school. So, you know, after like nine o'clock or whatever, and it'd have to end before two. And then you wouldn't be able to practice again until like 11 o'clock at night because he's like, I want to be home with my family and hang out with my kids, have dinner with them. So it's like, that was part of, also why he had such a crazy schedule is not just because he was had the mentality of, hey, you got to wake up at 530 if you want to, you know, be the best. But also because he's like, no, I want to see my daughters go to school and I want to drop them off in my Lamborghini, right? And pull up in my Lamborghini, <laughs> wish him wish him luck at school that day, right? And so Kobe all around, like I said, man, this, this one just hits hard. You're right. It was unexpected. It wasn't like he was sick. It wasn't like he was old, right? Or or going through like drug and alcohol abuse. It was just came out of nowhere. And so he's definitely going to be missed by the, by the sports world. Yeah, it definitely just gives you perspective on life. You know what I mean? Again, we're talking about a guy in his early 40s that this happened to. Now, when I think back to, and you know, get a little personal, but give a little bit insight into kind of like for our viewers of who we are and whatnot. When I think about like a project like Game the Slump Busters, I started and everything like that. I just like thought to myself after like seeing a couple of close friends die at like 23 and 28, I was like, you know, this life thing, it's not a guarantee. Each day Mm -hmm. is, as they say, a blessing. So go out there, take a shot, jack up 50 shots, (laughs) be like Kobe, you know, try something new. Like if you've always wanted to do something, do it because we don't know how many more days we have. We don't know how finite this life is, Mm -hmm. but embrace it. Maybe you won't be a five-time NBA champion, league's most valuable player, 18-time all-star, but maybe you could be an 18-time all-star in your day-to-day, like how people view you, like when they think of the character of you as a human being, they're like, mm-hmm. that's an all-star personality. That's the mama mentality. This guy gets it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Like, and I've, I've been thinking the exact same thing of like, man, if this dude who was literally the epitome of good health and athleticism can die at 41, right? And granted, helicopter crashes don't happen every day, right? And you can say <laughs> even that if, that was a freak accident, but like, yeah. 
You never know when it's going to happen, though. Even if we ever get to the point where we have helicopter money, it's definitely going to be make me a little bit uneasy. <laughs> yeah, no. So I've been thinking, right, like, because the, the lottery this past week, uh, somebody has won it since then, but it was up at like 340 million or something like that, or 390 million. And I was thinking like, man, if I won the lottery, like my now Kobe Bryant rule though, is going to be that I don't fly in helicopters, right? <laughs> like that's just the one thing. It doesn't matter how much money I have. I'll never fly in a helicopter out of, out of respects for Kobe Bryant and fear for my life. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the tough thing. Like legitimately just not to go on a helicopter side rate, but it's tough when those things crash. Mm -hmm. It's like when you crash in a motorcycle on the freeway. There's very little protection. Just very often, this is the case when a small aircraft or a helicopter crashes. Like there's very few t chances of survival, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And it's just terrible considering that there was families on board with this one. Don't blame it on Kobe. Don't blame it on the pilot because they were just trying to live their day to day. Like Kobe took this flight a thousand times mm -hmm. and it just it happens, you know, like life is funny like that. Again, like you could just be walking the street and get hit by a bus. The difference between flying a helicopter and just something stupid happening, like a bike running into you or knocking you down, mm -hmm. you never know what can happen. So again, just <laughs> embrace this thing. So with that said, you know, let's add some levity in this conversation. Let's just talk about how awesome Kobe Bryant was. I mentioned a couple of like his notable statistics. I mean, this guy was drafted at age 17 and had a 20 year career. Like mm -hmm. at age 17, <laughs> we were still in high school, you know? So it's funny you think about that. But meanwhile, he's over there, you know, he's a all rookie second team. He got, gets two jerseys retired, which I have my questions about the Mavericks retiring his jersey, just because when you look at the track record for retired jerseys in sports, the only like other notable example comes to mind is Jackie Robinson and really, you know, obviously changed the game for baseball. Mm -hmm. I mean, I appreciate Kobe, but, you know, it's an interesting thing to think about. He actually competed in the slam dunk contest and won it back in 97. What do you think about stars not wanting to even participate? That's awesome. I think that should be motivation for some people to step up. LeBron, slam dunk contest, please. Mm -hmm. All right. We got, let's see, what else we got here? All NBA first team. 11 times so 11 times in the league he was voted as the best and then of course that's you know, more than a decade right that's yeah. more than a decade of being all nba <laughs> exactly unquestioned people just knew he was a two-time scoring champ in 2006 and 2007 which again you just know he was jacking him up well in 2006 and 2007 they went down more than any other player and that's just you know that's his resume fourth all-time NBA scorer, you know, like I said, LeBron did just pass him the previous night, which does make this a little bit harder. I was waiting for LeBron's response on this, and I think that he had a good statement that he put out there. Mm -hmm. It made sense. Like, it, it was hard for him. He, it, it was hard for him the previous night just passing Kobe without knowledge of what would happen the following day. Yeah. You know, so with that said, these are his stats. These are the awards. Tell me about your favorite Kobe moments. All right, so I've, I've been thinking about this a lot, right? And, and so there's a million favorite Kobe moments that I have. And I guess I'll start sort of in like a top five uh, bottom up, right? So, okay. so of course, you know, one of my favorite moments of his were when he dropped 81. And this was about the time where you and I were starting to become old enough. So I was born in 94. You were born in 94, did you? Or 94? Yep, yep, yep. 94. And so, you know, the time he started getting to the point right like we we knew that he was going to be good when he was a 17 year old player but we were still two years old or whatever when he first came into the league but when he started to drop 81 that was when you and I were starting to become old enough to understand sports and it's like oh man if I know that <laughs> close to 100 points is a good thing right and oh, the fact that Kobe yeah. can drop 81 oh my gosh Oh, of course like when you consider so Will Chamberlain's 100 we don't even have video footage of it we just mm -hmm. have to take people's word that he scored 100 points in that game and took a picture right after with that number. So seeing Kobe's like highlights of that 81-point game, just seeing Jalen Rose just absolutely in dismay as it was happening to him, mm -hmm. it's just something we can always remember and look back on fondly. 81 points. I don't think anyone – I mean, James Harden's at a ridiculous pace, but even I don't think he could drop more than 81. Yeah, there's no way. Like in the, in the modern NBA, as things are right now – I think one, just because it's so conducive to like team ball and spreading out that, that offense, creating, you know, modern spacing or whatever, it makes it harder to do it. But two, just the fact like 
you would have to play your hardest probably for all four quarters to be able to drop 81. Like, and be so efficient. Exactly. Yeah. Like just to continually attack the basket, be efficient, put up shots that are falling. Like that was just an outstanding feat. That's my number five. My number four, and I always go back and forth on this one, but I really do think that it's going to be that 2008 Olympics, right? Where he put up back-to-back threes to get us in, into the lead ahead of, of Spain. He even put his teammate Pau Gasol on his own ass, right? Like, <laughs> like that's just the monster that Kobe was. Because had Kobe not put up those back-to-back threes, I think, I think we'd lose that game. And that was the point where, you know, you had some of these other players starting to become really, really good, right? Like, so your Mellows were becoming good. You had your LeBron Jameses, your Dwayne Wade and stuff. Like, that was a stacked team. And Kobe was sort of getting towards the older end, right, starting to pass the torch. But even he had to show these guys, like, hey, look, you know, we're down right now. Like, I got to do something to get us in this game and, and ice it for us. And, and so hitting those back-to-back threes, I think, is really what, what won us that 2008 Olympics, as good as that team was, you know. Again, mama mentality, guys, compete in the Olympics. Don't like leave your country hanging because Kobe wants you out there. Everyone wants to see the best players out there because it's what helps grow this game. And Mm -hmm. why so many other countries are kicking ass nowadays is because they got to also grow up watching Kobe Bryant, see him drain those back-to-back threes and realize this guy's good. I want to play like him. So be on the world stage, be that influence for the next generation, not just in our country, but in other Mm -hmm. countries. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think this is also why there's such a debate, right? Of who is the best, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan. And Kobe statistically probably is not as good as LeBron James, right? Like LeBron probably leads him in assists. Right now we saw he just leave, he just left them in points. He doesn't have as many rings as Kobe does. But the thing that Kobe had was like, hey, even if he wasn't the most efficient on that night or it wasn't his best game, when it came down to crunch time, he was willing to take that shot and put the dagger in you, you know? And, and like I said, putting those back-to-back threes in the 2008 Olympics, I think that is really what won it for, for us. So that'll be my number four. And then, man, getting into my top three Kobe moments, it's always a little bit tough. I think... Number three has to be the no flinch, right? Okay. That to me just tells me like, yeah, this dude's a badass, right? doesn't matter what sport it is, but like I'm going to stare down Matt Barnes, stay right in his face, just stay calm, cool, collected. And even if he fakes a basketball pass to my nose, right? I'm just going to stand there and keep my cool because I know that I'm better than this dude. And whatever this dude's going to try to dish out, I know that I'm better than him and I'm going to beat him. So that to me, number three epitomizes like, greatness not affected by the alternate camera angles to say he may have been looking away i still don't think so like how many people are are willing even to get that close anyways when it comes to defense right like Mm -hmm. you're that you're just right up in his face staying calm cool collected you know moving your arms back and forth so to me i still i still think the no flinch is is number three top (laughs) Kobe moments is that like the equivalent of the sports version of the jfk grassy knoll (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I got conspiracy theories, you know, like, <laughs> no, I mean, like I said, I, I still think that dude, like that moment, the fact that he's willing to be like right up there, right in his face. And, and maybe you could say, oh, the alternate camera angle, he was looking away. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe I'm biased. I'm a look there, Stan. All right. Number two, Tom. Number two for me, and this is hard. One and two are, are very close to each other, right? But I've got to say, Tearing his Achilles and coming back on the court. We already talked about it, right? So I don't want to beat, beat the drum to death, but the fact that you can tear your Achilles, right? And we, we just saw this happen with, with Kevin Durant, right? Like his Achilles tore, he threw the ball away. And this is not an indictment on Kevin Durant by any means, right? Like that is a gruesome injury and that's hard. And he had to sit down on his butt and scoot off the court because it's like, shoot, that thing just snapped. I can't walk. And, you know, there's injuries where if you look up pictures on, on Google, even a torn Achilles, your foot can be laying down flat on the floor and your knee folds all the way over, you know, so your knee would be touching the floor at the same time your foot is laying down flat and your toes and your heel are on the floor as well. Like that is a gruesome injury. And I don't blame Kevin Durant for throwing away the ball and scooting off the court when he tore his Achilles because he's like, this hurts, right? Like I can't walk, I can't move. And the fact that Kobe got fouled, tore his Achilles, got back up and said, hey, I'm going to walk on my own, shoot these two free throws and make them, and then I'm going to walk off on my own, like, to the locker room. 
that to me, you know, there's no other athlete that I'd rather have that mentality. You know, like that is the mentality you want as an athlete. Doesn't matter what happens. Doesn't matter how broken you are, how banged up you are. I'm still going to get my job done, you know? Again, this is just the ultimate thing against like load management, taking games off. And that's, mm-hmm. again, why I appreciate this guy so much more looking back on it in hindsight. I just appreciate that. Uh, you know, it's funny, consider the parallel. So they were playing the Warriors when he tore his Achilles, right? Mm-hmm. And who was also like on that team was Clay Thompson. Now, Clay yeah. Thompson in his last finals, he went up there with a tore, torn ACL and shot free throws. Yeah. So it's great to see that that same drive was also in Clay Thompson. I don't know mm-hmm. if it was subliminally from seeing Kobe do it or he was able to like shake off the ACL a little bit more with the adrenaline still in his system. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's just an interesting sports parallel to think about. And we'll get more into it eventually. But like just before you introduce your number one, I just want to get your quick thoughts on the Lakers Clippers game. They got postponed this past mm-hmm. one, because to me, and we've talked about this a little bit in the pre-show. Again, I think the ultimate way to honor Kobe would have been to play that game. Yeah, and, and I agree with you a little bit, right? Like, I think Kobe would have told them, hey, it doesn't matter about me. Go play that game, right? Like, suck it up, guys, and get back out there. And Kobe, I think, would have said that to them, to their face. Like, if you had the ghost of Kobe and he was there in the locker rooms with the Clippers and the Lakers, he would have told them, suck it up and get out there, right? Like, so what that I'm gone? You know, go play, go play your game. But that being said, L.A., like, That was Kobe's city, right? That was the city that drafted him. He was one of the rare, you know, single franchise players, right, to to play for only one franchise and bring him the amount of rings that he did. And so I know that it would have been it would have been hard, especially on LeBron James. Like we had said, like it was already sort of sombering and, and hard for him passing Kobe's record the night before. But then to hear like hey, you just passed Kobe's record, but Kobe just died, you know, the next day, right? Like, I think it would have been really hard. I don't think LeBron would have been focused. Kyle Kuzma, we know, has worked out with Kobe Bryant, right? Like, he's literally been trained by Kobe Bryant. So he's close to the family. He's close to Kobe. Dwight Howard had his obvious run-ins with Kobe, right? And that was almost one of my top five Kobe moments is Dwight Howard was on the court yelling something when Howard was on the Rockets after the Lakers. And Kobe just walks up to him and and calls him soft, right? Like, like you've got this dude that's a seven footer, probably, you know, close to a hundred pounds more than Kobe, at least 50 pounds more. And Kobe doesn't back down, walks straight up to his face, looks him dead in the eyes and calls him soft, right? Like, (laughs) I mean, come on now. Like, like, you know, but, but Dwight Howard has even said like, Hey, Kobe Bryant, it was a good thing that he told me that. And now playing back on the Lakers again, I think Dwight Howard realizes that yeah, I was soft. Right. And so I think it would have been hard for Dwight. And, and then of course you've got the front office grew up watching Kobe, right? So the bus family, you've got Rob Polinka was his old, old manager. Right. And was the one that, you know, helped Kobe throughout his entire career. It would have been a very difficult sort of moment ad was also really close to kobe right so i don't think anthony davis would have been in his right mind and so just all together as as much as i think kobe would have said hey guys get out there like it's just you know it's just somebody passed away that's it like hurry up and play the game i do think that it would have been difficult and so i'm okay with them postponing the game yeah i just thought that it was maybe i'm thinking of this from like a ultimate storybook kind of like ending kind of thing the fact that the lakers and the clippers were playing each other Battle of LA, meanwhile, all this stuff going on. I think Mm -hmm. it could have been one of those great unifying moments in sports. Like when I think back to George W. Bush, regardless if you're Democrat, Republican, non-New Yorker, New Yorker, that moment when he threw out that first pitch in New York Mm -hmm. following the World Trade Center attacks was one of those most powerful bonding moments that we've ever had. And I thought seeing the two LA teams specifically – play a game in memorial to Kobe, his legacy, even if they did the whole let the 24 second shot clock run out. I -hmm. thought that would have been a fitting tribute, more fitting certainly than we'll talk about the all-star game rules changes that came to be. Mm -hmm. But I thought it would have been a good one. And maybe we didn't need that. Maybe it would have just been all extra fluff. But I think it would have been a great moment for his fans, Mm -hmm. anyone that appreciates his legacy. But Oh, well, it's, it's done. I just thought I'd get my piece out for that. Let's get back to your list. Let's finish it with the number one Kobe moment. 
All right, number one Kobe moment for me, and some people I'm sure are gonna disagree with me, right? And they're gonna be like, oh, there are some other ones that are, that are better than that. But it has to be for me, his last game, dropping 60 points. Like what other guy goes out in his last game, his last performance, not only gets his team the win, but literally drops numbers where we commemorate young guys for dropping those numbers, right? Like we commemorate whenever Devin Booker has a 50 point game. We commemorate James Harden when he drops, you know, 40 in a night. And Kobe Bryant said, this is my last game I'm ever going to play. And I'm going to go out and drop 60 points on these guys. Like that to me, like if that doesn't spell out Kobe for you, I don't know what else does. And as, as much as I love the torn Achilles, the Colin Dwight soft, the, you know, 08 Olympics, right? The waking up at 5.30 in the morning. The fact that Kobe said, hey, this is the last time you guys are ever going to see me. So I'm going to make sure that everybody m- remembers it. And, you know, that's about as Kobe as it gets for me. <laughs> you know, that, that is a perfect, like, encapsulation of, like, Kobe. And the fact that he got the W, I think, is the biggest point of that. It would have been great if that was in the playoffs, of course. It was sad that the Lakers kind of diminished as his like career started yeah. to go into his later phases. Mm-hmm. But the fact they got a W, because you talk about those younger guys, when they drop 50, they drop 60, they drop 70 like Devin Booker, it doesn't always result in a win, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. I don't know how if you're Devin Booker, you drop 70 and lose, but away from the point here. We'll mention a couple more moments in there, just honorable mentions. Mm-hmm. And believe me, this one hurts, but him winning with that, Lakers team over the Celtics in the NBA Finals game seven I do think that's a huge moment because let's face it the big three the Lakers Celtics rivalry it's always just one of those Mm -hmm. transcendent title like games because those teams just have such a storied history together Mm -hmm. and I think that's a great one and then one that I just saw this week so not necessarily one that a lot of people may know about but apparently he went up to the Portland Trailblazers and told them you're not allowed to be wearing Kobe's because y'all suck basically (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay yeah that that one that one's close to being in my top five now like think of, just think about that that's how much of a badass kobe was like legit the fact that he's like if you're gonna be wearing any of my gear your ass better not suck <laughs> like, <laughs> and the, the willingness to tell them that like you guys are garbage. Take my shit off, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, these guys are NBA superstars, or at least stars. I think Dame was the one that dropped that one. And Dame, we think very highly of him. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it's hilarious that Kobe would drop that one. I was probably just joking <laughs> around, but still, I think that that just speaks to Kobe's. I think there's I mean, <laughs> a great one, too, where yeah. I guess they were in practice, and he like, said something along the lines of get these guys off the court because, again, they suck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're not as good. I think that's just, again, a great mentality to have kids, especially if you're just learning a sport, because he's doing that in practice. Mm-hmm. He's doing that in practice because he wants to be the best when he's on the court, when he's in that game. You treat practice how you would the game, and you're going to win a lot. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, literally, like I, I've said it a million times on this podcast, and I'm sorry it's so repetitive, but – if there, if you, it doesn't matter what type of athlete you are, it could be golf, could be soccer, could be football, wrestling, fighting, right? A million sports. But if you have that mindset that Kobe Bryant has, like that's what's going to make you successful, without a doubt. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you know, that's that's Kobe's like top moments. Those are like some of the like greatest highlights of his career. I think that at least the five you mentioned are certainly going to be on everyone's like top ten list. We can mm-hmm. argue the order. We can argue which was best. But I do think that that's a fitting tribute. Like, you saw this guy's entire career. I saw his career from an outsider perspective, not as a fan, but as someone who would just kind of look at the box scores and just say, like, damn, Kobe put up another 40-point game. Damn, Kobe won another championship, another MVP, another scoring title, like all this stuff. And it just helps you realize just how good this guy was. Mm -hmm. And we lost the legend. We lost the good one. And I can only just, like, think, you know, of him just, like, breaking ankles, you know, upstairs. That's mm-hmm. just like how I like to envision whenever I go to sleep, like following this like tragedy. Again, I'll just go back to it before we like move on. I just want to say like, live each day to the fullest. Appreciate each and every day because we don't know how many we have left guys. But yeah, anything more? Anything else you want to like touch on before we move on? Because yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I just want to say, you know, rest in peace to Kobe and Gigi, right? And everybody else involved in that crash. It's, it's tragic. It's awful. But 
you know, forever he's going to be memorialized. And the fact that people from all around the world, you know, are, are supporting Kobe and his family, right? The Bryant family. And there's even talks of changing the logo to Kobe, right? Which I think would be very fitting. Jerry West is the one that drafted Kobe actually, right? And, <laughs> and Jerry West is the current logo and they are both Lakers, right? So I think that would be, be fitting. I don't know if they should though, right? Like, cause then are we going to change the logo every time somebody passes away? There's talks about that. But I mean, just the fact that they want to do all these things, change the all-star game this year, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, all these things, I'm sure they're going to put up a statue, right? Like, it just tells you how impactful Kobe was. And so he forever definitely last, uh, uh, left a lasting impression on me. And so he'll, he'll always be remembered as one of the greatest basketball players of all time. And he left a lasting impression. Hopefully that lasting impression doesn't continue into the all-star game roles because I don't, I don't really know about that tribute at least. Uh-huh. So yeah. I just, which, before we move into Super Bowl talk, because, you know, this podcast is pretty much going to be dedicated towards what we just covered, you know, the whole tragedy that occurred. And of course the Super Bowl, but these All Star Game rules, man. And if I'm misquoting them, feel free to let me know in the comments, guys. But from my understanding, they're gonna play three quarters, and mm-hmm. then the last quarter is gonna be untimed. The winning team will have to score 24 points or have 24 points added to whatever their score is at the end of the third quarter. And mm-hmm. if you're the team that's trailing, you have to reach that mark. So the amount you're already in deficit. So let's say you're down eight. You have to essentially score 32 points in order to win the game. So that's more or less kind of the structure of this all-star game. Now I got to say a little bit odd. I would have just preferred to generally what Twitter was going with of one team wears eight, one team wears 24. But I do think maybe the NBA is still being a little bit protective over the fact that they can't sell those um, all-star game jerseys if you only have one set of numbers and one set of numbers on the other side. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit strange in my opinion, right, of the way that they set this up. I think it's also really obscure and hard to understand for, like, just the general fan, especially if if you're not keeping up with all the changes to the all-star game format, right, and you just happen to tune in to watch it all of a sudden you're going to see the score reset to zero right in the fourth quarter. And you're going to be like, what the heck just happened? Um, what I will say that I do appreciate. So as much as I, I'm like, I don't agree with the format. This seems a little bit weird. Like there could have been a better way to, to do this, right. That they will be awarding a hundred thousand dollars to, to charities, right. For the winning teams choosing. Right. So I do think that that is cool. I can't remember if that's based off of particular quarters or if that's based off of the game as a whole. But I do know that they're going to give some money to charity. But yeah, you're, you're right. I think, it's, uh, I think it is a little bit strange of a format. It makes it a little bit harder to watch. As much as I like that they want to do something for Kobe in this All-Star game, given that, you know, we talked about how many All-Star votes that he had got, right? But still, like, it, you're right. The, the rules are a little bit obscure. They're a little bit hard to follow. And they kind of just don't make a whole lot of sense. If the ballot hadn't already closed, I wouldn't have been surprised if you had a clamoring of NBA fans just writing him on the ballot. But Mm -hmm. either way, the All-Star game is hard to watch, so I don't think these rule changes are going to really change that much. (laughs) It is what it is. All right. Now, I will say that I think basketball's All-Star game, though, sort of has, like, the most watchability, right? Like, Mm. I think even more than the NFL, because at that point, it's sort of like two-hand touch, and then you've got, like, you've got linemen becoming quarterback and throwing the ball, right, to, you know, another lineman, right, or something like that. So, as far as watchability, I do think that it's a whole lot of fun to watch some of these guys. Like, as little defense as they play and as much offense-focused as it is, People do like to see like three cool three pointers and cool dunks during the game, you know. Personally, I think baseball does have the best all star game of the three major sports. Heck, I'll even throw hockey into this one. Hockey, the fans have pretty much quit on their all star game. The Pro Bowl is always awkwardly timed because we're more focused on the Super Bowl, of course. And mm-hmm. if you are a team playing in the Super Bowl, obviously you're not sending your players to that. So we're not necessarily getting the best players. Another sub story of this like tragedy, of course, was it happened during the Pro Bowl. A lot of people are clamoring for, should you just cut off the Pro Bowl? It's like, no, there's still people that watch it over. Yeah. In fact, it's out of the major all-star games. It's the most viewed, which is ironic considering how poorly we view the Pro Bowl, but people still watch <laughs> like it. We just trashed it, right? Like exactly. for both of us, I think it was the bottom of our list for, for all-star games, right? One day we'll have to do sit down and legitimately do a ranking of like the major sports all-star games. I think Pro Bowl is legitimately my dead last. 
I think yeah. more people care about like the skills challenges, the mm-hmm. like home run derbies, the slam dunk contest. I think that's really what people care about during All-Star Weekend because the rest of it is kind of meh. I actually like when the MLB had the rule that the winning team decides home field advantage for the World Series. I thought that was kind of a neat thing to try and add interest to the game, add competitiveness mm-hmm. to the game. Mm-hmm. But a good chunk of people also didn't like that, so whatever. <laughs> No use trying to boost up an all-star game because the players don't care about it, so why should we as fans, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you about a game I do care about. I care about this one very adamantly on a very personal level. <laughs> Super Bowl 54 in Miami, hence the Miami Vice cover that you guys may have noticed. I've mm-hmm. done that one all night. <laughs> but anyway, Niners, Chiefs, we mentioned a little bit on this last show. So this show is obviously dedicated for our Super Bowl prediction. Who's going to win this game? Why they're going to win this game? Some fun headlines going in. So we're going to format this first by we're going to talk about the Niners. We're going to break down the Niners season, starting from the draft, what people thought about them, all the way up to what brought them here onto Super Bowl Sunday. Then we're going to do the same thing for the Chiefs. And we're going to add that all together at the end. And see what comes out of our opinions on how this game's going to go. So let's start first with the Niners. Let's talk about their season a little bit. So in the preseason, Dre and I made our predictions. Dre, you had them as 6-10. Six, six and ten. I <laughs> had them as 9-7. and seven. So essentially, I thought they were going to be good. I thought they were going to be better. You, yeah, I better than mine for sure. Exactly. I didn't have them as a playoff team. I certainly didn't have them as a Super Bowl team. But here we are. Now, what kind of went into that? So Jimmy G, his first season coming off of that injury, that ACL injury, allowed the Niners to slip in the draft. So they pick up Nick Bosa, which they almost missed out on because the Arizona Cardinals were sitting there at one. So in a lot of people's draft boards, Nick Bosa was the number one overall prospect. But this little firecracker named Kyler Murray just happened to shoot up draft boards prior to the season, prior to the combine. And suddenly, marked himself as number one, and I do not blame the Cardinals for drafting him at number one. Made sense, especially when you saw how that guy played at points during the season. He's going to be a good one. But bottom line, Niners get Nick Bosa out of it. Huge piece to their defensive line. They also trade for D Ford from the Kansas City Chiefs for a second-round pick. So, again, now they got their edge pass rusher. So then let's get into the season. Week one, Tampa Bay. Man, kind of a, a road game to start. East Coast trip. They end up pulling out the 31 to 17 victory. So good win, especially in hindsight when we look at how Tampa Bay finished their season. Bruce Arians, Jameis Winston, 30 for 30 season. Good win. Mm-hmm. Then they played the Bengals, the lowly Bengals, 41 to 17. This is the type of game you expect a good team to have against a trash team like the Bengals. So at this point, they haven't really played anyone in people's minds. So at least they blew out the bad team in week two. Then they play the Steelers. So fun game for us is the slump buster with Juju and Dre here. Trademark, mm-hmm. caught it, copyright, patent. But obviously, Steelers fan across from me. Niners fan right here. Niners have like five turnovers in this game. It just anytime they touch the ball on offense in the first half, I'm thinking – God, like, are they going to be able to hold on to this thing? Is this thing just, like, covered in butter or something? (laughs) Like, why does it keep falling out of their hands? Mm -hmm. Anyway, strip sack on Mason Rudolph, get the ball back. Jimmy G hits a clutch throw to hit Dante Pettis in the end zone. They go into the bye week 3-0. So they're undefeated. They're undefeated. National narrative is, well, the decent little start to the Niners season. But, again, they haven't really played anyone. We'll see how they do on Monday night against this Browns team who – at this time, we still look at the Browns and we think Baker Mayfield, Odell, all of these pieces. This team is going to be the best talented team that Cleveland has had in their football modern era. Mm-hmm. And the Niners blow them out. First play of the game on offense, Matt Breda, like a 60-yard touchdown, and you just know it's going to be a long night for Cleveland, especially when you have Nick Bosa planting the flag <laughs> after that sack of Baker Mayfield showing that people still care about their college alumni status. Mm-hmm. Because he, he remembered that Ohio State-Oklahoma rivalry, and he took it to heart. Again, national narrative. Niners haven't played anyone. This Browns team, they're trashed 
two, that's when people start turning on the Browns a little bit. How about playing the Rams, the defending NFC champion, the team that was in the Super Bowl the previous year and, well, got shut down by Bill Boucher and those New England Patriots? Well, the Niners shut them down too. A 20-7 win in L.A. And other than a, like, opening drive touchdown, the Rams did nothing in this game. Jared Goff threw for less than 100 yards and just got abused by this defense. So, hey, Niners are suddenly creeping up to 5-0. and So this is make or break. You went undefeated in your first month of the season. You beat a tough division opponent. Off to mm-hmm. Washington to face a team that hadn't won a game at this point in a horrible condition game. The Mud Bowl, the Slop Bowl. Niners win it 9-0. We have that cool moment of the slip and slide, Nick Bosa, the entire defensive line, treading water along the sideline after a sack of Case Keenum. Congratulations, you beat a bad Redskins team. What next? <laughs> Panthers. Now, this is a team that we did think positive things on. They were trying to get, get, starting to get it together with Kyle Allen. They had benched Cam. I think this is the first week that Kyle Allen was officially named the starter, regardless of what Cam was doing. And we said it during that, like, little run there, like, Kyle Allen, he hasn't really played a good defense yet. So let's see what he does against the Niners. Well, as it would turn out, Niners ran all over the Panthers. Kyle Allen had no defense. And they just made him look like an undrafted second-year quarterback. Okay. So, again, Niners sitting here at this point in the season. They are 7-0. and And they get to play a division opponent. Halloween, Thursday night, Cardinals, Niners, they win it 28-25. Now, I know a lot of people look at that score and think, oh, the Cardinals were in this one. It was a close one. Really, if you take away a 70-yard touchdown at the end, the Niners dominated this one through. Probably Jimmy G's best game as a Niners starting quarterback. Had four touchdowns in that one. So this is the big one. So they're 8-0 at this point. Only them and the Patriots are undefeated. And... A lot of people, like, if you remember right, when you compare the undefeated teams in between the Chiefs, Patriots, Niners, you ever seen the movie Grown Ups? You know, Rob Schneider's, like, daughters in that one, how there's the two hot ones and the one (laughs) kind of... The last one. (laughs) The more homely-looking girl. Well, a popular internet meme was to put the Niners logo on the more homely-looking one, and the Patriots and the Chiefs were the two hot ones, right? Well, Monday night, Seahawks, this team has owned the Niners for years. Believe me, I've lived it a thousand times, seeing Russell Wilson escape the pocket and hit someone downfield. They lose it in overtime. So undefeated season, gone. Fantastic Monday night game. They had a rookie kicker. He made the shot. He made the kick to end regulation, get it all tied up, but just shanked the hell out of the game, winning one in overtime. So... Clock management is brought up a question of Kyle Shanahan. People start looking at the team. Well, you couldn't beat the division opponent that's just been giving you issues for the last decade. What does that mean? Well, let's play the Cardinals again. Two out of three weeks. They trail 16 points at home in this game. And like, oh, great. So they lost their first game. They're going to tail off a little bit. They're a little bit in their fills. Not, not so much. They actually come back and win that game 36 to 26. A little inflated by a late fumble at the end. So, again, you beat the Cardinals. Cool. Cool story, bro, right? But, wait, we got Aaron Rodgers and the Packers coming into town. Sunday night football. Big game. There's no way Aaron Rodgers is not going to look fantastic, right? Wrong. (laughs) 37-8, Niners. Sign of things to come, right? We'll get more into that one. But this is where the heavy hitters start to come into play because Ravens on the road, Lamar Jackson. At one point, I swear in our power rankings, what do we have? The, we had the Ravens like number one, what, mm-hmm. felt like eight straight weeks at the end of the year? Oh, that was a very long time, a very good stretch time. Yeah, after they blew out the Patriots, there was no stopping this team. They were just running over everyone. In fact, they didn't stop. They beat the Niners 20 to 17 on another game winning field goal. So at this point, the Niners have lost two games and they've lost two on game winning field goals. Ouch. Well, how did you bounce back? You beat the Saints in the Superdome 48 to 46. 
And that game was an outstanding game to watch. Kyle Shanahan was dialing up amazing plays. In fact, Emmanuel Sanders threw a touchdown. Jimmy G had what I think is his best game as a Niner, truly. And, of course, you had George Kittle just dragging four guys along with him to get them into field goal range. Probably one of the better moments of the NFL season. Well, then here comes the trap game. (laughs) You get to play the Falcons at home. The Falcons got hot at the right time. They actually beat the Saints, too, set end of the season 7-9. and nine. But on a Julio Jones touchdown that came down in inches, they just happened to get that game-winning score, beat the Niners at home. Niners have three losses at this point and get to finish the season with the Rams and the Seahawks. Rams still fighting for a division, a wild-card spot at this point. Saturday night game. College football is already over, so NFL is playing on Saturday night. This one was a great one. Rams jumped out to early lead. You have Jared Goff escaping the pocket, which is impressive because Jared Goff is basically a statue. And this was, again, another moment, and I think this is going to come into play, where Jimmy G had to put the team on his back, had two third and 16s and was able to get this team into scoring range to get the game-winning field goal and win that game, setting up a big game in Seattle in a place that's just been the Niners' own personal house of horrors. And they managed to win it on a game-saving tackle by Dre Greenlaw, a linebacker drafted out of Arkansas earlier this year. And it was a fantastic game. like. This little Seattle was chasing the Niners all year, making it difficult for the Niners all year. Because if the Niners had lost this game, they would have dropped from the number one seed all the way to the fifth seed and would have had to play in Philadelphia. Instead, Niners win this game. They're the number one seed. Got to take a rest. Seattle goes to Philadelphia, wins that game. And the Niners just get a wait for Kirk Cousins. The Slump Busters' favorite, Kirk Cousins, which this was a big one because Kyle Shanahan had the Niners not got that trade from the, from the Patriots, probably would have signed Kirk Cousins in free agency. He was his boy. He was the guy he had in Washington. Instead, Jimmy G, Niners roll that defense. Again, unstoppable, looks terrific. And then we said, on our last episode, there was no way we felt that the Packers could get blown out again. There is no way after what happened to them the first time that this Packers team would come in as flat as they did. Well, they did, and the Niners end up rolling, and that's what brings them to Super Bowl 54. Whew, that was a, that was a mouthful. Gray, you wanna? I know. Do you, you need, give me a, do you need some water or something after that? Like, geez. I, I, I am a bit parched. I am a bit parched, <laughs> uh, Trey. So, to give my vocal cords a quick break, you want to kind of like talk about the Niners season and basically that whole summary I had. And <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, to our listeners that need a break from Juju just bragging about his team all, all you know, for the past twenty minutes. Um, no, I. The, the Niners had a remarkable season, especially if you think about, right, like we were clowning on Jimmy G coming back from injury. We knew that he, he had gotten injur- injured, right, and we knew he was coming back. But, like, in the preseason, he did not look very good, right? There was that zero quarterback ranking game that he had. Like, oh. literally did not do a single thing right. Oh, remember that headline coming out of training camp where he threw five straight interceptions? Mm-hmm. Five straight? I mean, I don't know if that's more against Jimmy G or t- – sign of how good this defense was right yeah I mean and the fact that like okay their offense is not going to be good nobody would have thought like if your quarterback is throwing five straight interceptions right on back-to-back plays in practice right that's not even a real game where you're going to have people literally coming for your head right there's no way this this offense is going to be good but Jimmy G has been able to get it together and like you said he's shown like He's shown when you have to be just a game manager and say, hey, I'm going to let my defense do their thing and I'm going to do just enough to get the win. But then he's also shown where he could take control and say, hey, 
I've got to get our team in position to win these close games. And especially, like you said, that Saints game where you have a high scoring offense like a Drew Brees and the Saints where they're just going to town and, you know, they're putting up tons of points. And the fact that, hey, I have to be able to outscore them. And so the fact that you have a quarterback that can put up 48 points if he needs it is very promising. And so uh, the defense really has been sort of what has, what has driven this team to, to the spot that they're at. But you definitely cannot count out their offense. Yeah, I mean, when you consider what Kyle Shanahan has been able to do with this team, he definitely is one of the better offensive minds in the game. Mm-hmm. And I know they haven't really uncorked Jimmy G to this point in this postseason, but Kyle Shanahan said it best. When the run's working, why are you going to stop? Keep doing it until the other team can stop you. It's just like that argument for did you really have to blow them up that much? Well, if you have such a problem with it, stop me. And that's mm-hmm. exactly what this team's been able to do. And, you know, like overall, it's an it's impressive turnaround. I mean, coming off of, again, a season where you only win four games to being in the Super Bowl, if the Niners were able to pull off this victory, it would be one of the greatest turnarounds in sports. And it's funny, you look at, like, the Jimmy G injury, reflecting mm-hmm. on it. So the Niners would have been decent last season, but they would not have been great. Gain Nick Bosa, gain D Ford. Those were really the keys to unlock this team's potential. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy G said in one of his pressers leading into this game, hey, I, of course I didn't want to miss time. Of course I didn't want to be hurt on the sidelines. But maybe it was a blessing in disguise because we got two studs now on our defense, you know, and things are going great. They got another great wide receiver with Debo Samuel because they were hiring the second round due to an injury. So there's a lot of factors that came together for this team. And I mentioned it during like our preview. It was going to come down to health because this team, I mean, let's face it. I mentioned their bye week was all the way in week four. So they had that whole stretch where they played the Packers, Ravens, Saints, who had each of those two teams that only lost like two games at that point. I think it was the best winning percentage in a three-game stretch that any team has had ever had a play and you know they came out with a couple wins in that stretch like are you kidding me that that's fantastic considering where this team was how far they had to come Robert Sala the defensive coordinator this guy was gonna get fired like a year ago or at least every Bay Area headline I read said we got to get rid of Robert Sala we got to bring in a new defensive coordinator now people are mad that he didn't get the Browns head coaching job if you're Robert Sala, thank God you didn't get the Browns head coaching job. Yeah, no, I, I mean, this team, they've just been outstanding. And just to give, you know, a little bit more stats to them, right? So when it comes to total defense, like you said, is the fact that they were able to get all these defensive pieces. And for some parts of the season, they didn't quite have all of them there, right? Like there's guys that were injured, right? And, um, you know, now they've got them all back. But even so, like, even though there are some there defensive line right that would that was injured throughout a lot of the season or whatever um they are still number one in yards per game right so a total of 252.5 yards uh is what they allow per game the next closest is the new england patriots at 272 and then third uh would have been the baltimore ravens at 300 so i mean between the number three team and the number one team when it call when it comes to defense and, and yards per game right like that's 50 yards per game almost fewer than than the third team and 20 points fewer than, you know, the second team. And that's, to me, insane when it starts to get to the other, you know, between four and five, so that'd be between Seattle and Minnesota, there's only three yards per game difference, right? Um, so that just tells you how dominant there was. And then even, like, between the top ten, right? So, like, we would say, oh, top ten, Philly would have been top – would have been the number tenth team at 382 yards per game. So just the difference between the San Francisco's defense and everybody else was just outstanding. But not only that, like we said, like their offense started to come together too, and they're seventh in total yards offense. Now, granted, that's not as good as their opponent, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But that's still outstanding to have the number one defense and have a top 10 offense. Like that's the exact recipe that you sort of want uh, when it comes to a Super Bowl championship caliber team. Absolutely. I mean, it's been a joy to watch this team like develop, come together. Uh, They've been great on both sides of the ball, which is 
not something that a lot of teams could really hang their hat on. Like maybe you're good on offense, maybe you're good on defense. Mm-hmm. I think what's even more impressive, you mentioned the Patriots being up there on the defensive total defense list there. I mean, let's face it, the Patriots' schedule was a little bit soft. When you look at that Niners' schedule that I went through, it, yeah. that back half of the schedule comes off like a little bit more like a murderous row. Mm-hmm. You're not playing the Dolphins anymore with that one. So I, I do think that it's impressive that – because I was waiting until they played a good team. I was waiting until mm-hmm. they played a good team myself too just to see if they could do it. And then you're blowing out the Packers. You're, making, you're dusting the Vikings off the field. You go into the Saints stadium and beat them there. And how? You're even hanging with the Ravens in another rainy mess on the mm-hmm. road. <laughs> it, all three, even the loss was impressive in itself. I mean, yeah. I'm not mad that they split the series with Seattle because who knows you better than your division opponents, right? Not only that, but your division opponent has arguably another MVP candidate for quarterback every single season, right? Russ is always going to be in the talks for, is this our MVP, you know, of the season? Is he that good of a quarterback? And he absolutely is a fantastic quarterback. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Hey, Niners, it's been a ride. But let's talk about these chiefs here. Now I've been high on the chiefs too. Let's face it. Going back to the preseason, I was the highest on the chiefs. I had them as my number one team overall. 14-2, 14-2, and two, just cleaning up in the AFC. I thought passing the torch was going to happen between Brady and Mahomes, and here we are, Super Bowl Sunday, and that transition has seemed to happen. So not much notable in the draft, nothing big, but free agency. This team goes out there. They pick up Tyron Matthew, Honey Badger. They had to let go of longtime safety Eric Berry, who suffered through obviously a host of different injuries related to his cancer therapy and just in general his lower body extremities so a tough decision there but they decided to turn over the franchise or turn over the defense more specifically to honey badger big piece they added there they fired their defense coordinator brought in some fresh blood there as well and this is what the team had been missing for a good chunk of the season anyway fast forward it back into the regular season here Week one, they played this Jacksonville Jaguars team. And Jacksonville, I was pretty high on them, too. I thought this could be a sneaky playoff team. They could turn the corner. They just brought a Nick Foles. Their defense at the time still has Jalen Ramsey, who Jalen Ramsey and Tyree Kill, if you remember, had that little feud. Speaking of Tyree Kill, obviously he's got that big issue going on with his baby mama. So a lot of big questions. Is Tyree Kill even going to be on the field? They had just dealt with the Kareem Hunt issue the season before. Anyway, they end up winning that game big. They come out swinging 40-26, 1-0, exactly the start to the season they wanted. Next week, division opponent in Oakland, their final game they're ever going to play in Oakland. Well, Patrick Mahomes lights up the stadium again. Four touchdowns in that game in the first Half. In fact, I think he had it in the first quarter, if I remember that game correctly. Basically, just, again, example how explosive this team is. And this game, week three, didn't really seem big at the time. We didn't really know what to make of this Ravens-Chiefs matchup. Like, how good is Lamar Jackson? We just saw him bomb in the previous season's playoffs. Well, it turns out he was very good. So good that we had the reigning MVP and this season's MVP in that game. Chiefs win it 33-28. to 28. It was actually pretty one-sided on the Chiefs. I know the score doesn't really reflect it, but the Ravens had to do a little bit of comeback mode, a little bit of garbage time points mixed in. Chiefs won that one pretty dominantly. Anyway, they're 3-0. Good start to the season. And then here's the game that had Andre win, ranking the Lions high all season in our power rankings because the Chiefs-Lions matchup, Chiefs win 34-30, but the Lions led at points in this game, made it interesting. Matthew Stafford had one of his better games of the season. They and- were leading for most of the game. The, the, Lions, the <laughs> Lions looked outstanding. I mean, and the Chiefs are going to the Super Bowl. Well, I would say that I didn't think it was impressive, but I'd be lying. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, Detroit Lions, I still got your back. I love you guys. All right. Shout out to Motown there. I, I will still rank you high in my power <laughs> rankings next year. If they're not a top 10 in week one, I'm going to be disappointed. And then 
Motown Nation, Lions Nation, whatever you call yourselves, one pride, they're going to hold it against you. Anyway, <laughs> Chiefs at this point are 4-0. I'm riding high. I'm still ranking them number one, even over the Patriots, who are still dominant at this time. And then they hit a snag on Sunday night. They lose to the Colts. And at this time, the Colts were a bit of a mystery. They had just ha- suffered the Andrew Luck retirement. They had some big wins early on. And they just found a magic formula to beat Patrick Mahomes and keep this offense under wraps. I mean, the Chiefs offense scoring 13 points on Sunday night? Just something doesn't sound right about that. Well, the Colts managed to pull it off. And you think, okay, well, Chiefs are going to bounce back, right? Wrong. They actually lose the next week to the Texans. We'll get back to the Texans later. But anyway, Texans beat them 31-24. to 24. 24. Again, we'll get back to that point total later. And, yeah, I mean, this is an interesting moment because Deshaun Watson, Bill Bryan, that team, they needed this win to prove that they were legitimate within the AFC. And the Chiefs, I mean, back-to-back losses, that's not something you want to see from a playoff caliber team, certainly a Super Bowl team, right? Well, hey, let's bounce back on Thursday night. Let's play our division opponent. The Broncos should be an easy win. In fact, it is, 30-6. to The only problem with this game, It's the game that Patrick Mahomes suffers a knee injury. A knee injury on a quarterback sneak. A lot of people are on Andy Reid, like, how could you make him the quarterback sneak? How could you do this to the franchise quarterback? Guys, calm down. Quarterback sneak happens a million times in a year, and people don't Mm -hmm. generally get hurt on it. And I I, I mean, I think a lot of people are also demonizing Andy Reid for it because – they were winning, right, in such a dominant fashion. So they're like, why even risk it, blah, blah, blah. But you're right. Yeah, I mean, it's a sport. People get hurt. I don't care if you had an ankle injury. What does an ankle injury have to do with your knee anyway? Whatever. Anyway, Chiefs win that game, but they lose Matt Mahomes for, as it was fortunate enough, only a couple weeks. Matt Moore has to play the Packers, though, on Sunday night. Packers, again, a team that's fighting for respect because they, had, they were winning. They just weren't winning against good opponents. Well, they managed to beat a Matt Moore-led KC Chiefs. But, I mean, Matt Moore looked pretty decent in that game. He at least kept them sustainable. They win that game – or, sorry, they lose that game by seven, but they managed to bounce back and beat the Vikings the following week. 26-23, again, another Kirk Cousins letdown game. But, hey, Matt Moore got him a win. That's all he needed to do. So – Hey, Patty Cakes Mahomes is back. Let's get him in there. He gets to play the Titans. I, I know in this game, I projected him to come back swinging. I projected him to get the win. You projected him to get the win. This was at the point in the season two where we weren't sure what to do with Titans games. We were just picking him wrong every week. Well, we picked him wrong again because the Chiefs got upset by the Titans, which it's funny because you look back on this and it's like, Little did we know those two teams would be matching up in the AFC Championship game. (laughs) But Titans win that one. Derrick Henry gets a ton of carries in that one, which is, again, a great strategy to beat the Chiefs. Do whatever you can to keep Patrick Mahomes at bay. I mean, keeping at bay is still along 32 points, but it'll do. Next week, they get to play the Chargers. I'm not going to bang on Aris too much here. I mean, they did go 0-6 in division, but... When you have to play Patrick Mahomes twice a year, I mean, what are you going to do? He beats the Chargers 24-17, to leads into the bye week. So if any residual effect from Patrick Mahomes still dealing with that knee injury, we could put that to rest. He gets another week of rest. And he was going to use it to drum the Raiders 40-9. to So <laughs> Raiders are just going to have haunting nightmares of their final season of Oakland of just Patrick Mahomes just lighting up that defense because so consistent. This just, in fact, going back to the Chargers game, this marked off a stretch in the Chiefs season where they were able to rattle off, and I count, six wins in a row. And this goes into the next week to make up for the previous season's AFC Championship game. They're going into Foxborough to play the Patriots, the dynasty, the unbeatable Patriots, the team led by Tom Brady, Bill Belichick. They've ran this conference for two decades. 
there's no way they're not going to be in the AFC championship game, right? Wrong. The Chiefs set the groundwork for what would happen in terms of seeding, in terms of bye weeks, by beating the Patriots in Foxborough 23 to 16. Not Patrick Mahomes' best day at the office, but he didn't need to do that much because they got the W. Follow that up, get to play the Broncos. Thought the Broncos would come out a little tougher, but you know, Chiefs run over them again, 23 to 3. This one was a fun game against the Bears. So, again, not to rattle on, uh, what's his name, Ryan Pace too, too much, the Bears GM. You know, the same Bears GM that drafted Mitch Trubisky at number two, traded up to draft him, actually. What, meanwhile, Patrick Mahomes was sitting there at 10. He also had Deshaun Watson sitting in this draft, but, meh. What's two future Hall of Fame quarterbacks when you have Mitch Trubisky, am I right? <laughs> Either way. Yeah, either way, Patrick Mahomes, Kansas City, they roll. They beat the Bears 26-3 to in Chicago. Patrick Mahomes literally counts 10 fingers on his hand to represent the 10 draft picks it took for him to get selected in that year's um, draft. It's kind of funny to look back and see that all three of those quarterbacks were in the Pro Bowl together. Um, mm -hmm. Mitch Trubisky, you want to talk about that grown-ups meme of the ugly sister and the two hot sisters? Yeah, that that yeah, that that's the ugly one. <laughs> that that's the new one there. All right, close the season off strong. Let's beat the Chargers one more time and head into the postseason. And we thought <laughs> that the Chiefs would. So uh, the Chiefs get saved first of all by uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick, the Miami Dolphins. They managed to pull off a. They were a 10-point underdog, if I'm not mistaken, going into that game against New England. And they win it on a game-winning drive, causing the Chiefs to get the number two seed and the Patriots to have to play on wild-card weekend against the Tennessee Titans. So, divisional round. The Chiefs have the most miserable start to a division game that I have ever seen, whether it be muff puns, fumbles, you name it. They are down 24 to nothing against a Houston Texans team that had beat them earlier in the year. How are they going to come back? How are they going to, like, get over this loss? Andy Reid's legacy as a postseason choker? I mean, this is everything that Chiefs fans fear, right? Well, how about we sprinkle in seven straight scoring drives? 51 to 7. Let's outscore them by that margin over just three quarters. Yeah, you want a better example of how dominant this Chiefs offense can be at their best, how explosive they can be? Yeah, just put on the highlights of that game, and it gives you a little idea how good Patrick Mahomes is. Anyway, we got to avenge a loss in the AFC Championship game. Let's play those Titans one more time. Derrick Henry has just been running over the Patriots, runs over the Lamar Jackson-led Ravens, we can argue whether we got robbed of a great AFC championship game by not seeing those two play, but either way, here we are. They get a, we get to remember the Titans fondly as they lose to the Chiefs in the AFC championship game. Whether What it means for that franchise, we'll never know, but what it means for the Chiefs is they achieve their first Super Bowl in 50 years. So the last time this team was playing in the Super Bowl, Lynn Dawson was their quarterback. That's a name from the past. Man, that's been a journey. <laughs> Andre, I need to step in. My, sores, my throat's getting a little bit sore. <laughs> All right, let me get you a break while you can go drink some more water. Um, no, the Kansas City Chiefs, they've had an outstanding season. I think we both projected that they would do really well this season. Um, I just didn't know how, how well that they would do, right? We weren't sure. Could Pat Mahomes keep up that pace that he was at last season, which – had he not gotten injured, right, like he very well could have, and you, predict, you predicted that, Juju. You, you did a great job with him. Um, really, their offense has, has been what's carried on this entire season, but their defense wasn't as bad as what it was last year either, right? Like, so towards the start of the year, people were starting to say, especially during that loss where they had back-to-back -back losses, everybody's like, oh, their defense isn't, you know, what it needs to be in order to compete, blah, blah, blah. Well, Kansas City Chiefs right now have – the number nine when it comes nine defense when it comes to yards per game, right? So they're not too bad 
Uh, so even though they've got a really, really good offense, their defense is also pretty decent as well. And the combination of those two things, but just the pure explosiveness of that offense, the fact that you could be down by 24 points and you're still not out of a game, like, it's just insane to me, right? Like, you've just got so many explosive athletes on that offense when it comes to, you know, Tyra Kill, Pat Mahomes, all those guys that you can come back from any deficit and you still have a chance to win. That's just insane. Yeah. I mean, what they did on the defensive side of the ball definitely shored them up to make them, well, put them over the top. We know how good their offense is, but I got to give more credit to Steve Spagnuolo for his ability to rally the troops together and get them play harder this 10 this year. We'll talk about a like storyline that came from Super Bowl lead up. Frank Clark was another big addition to this defense as well. They they needed to replace like um, the old guard of like Justin Houston and some of their older players. So Frank Clark, Honey Badger, those two are great pieces to have on the defensive side of the ball. And I've just said it, Mahomes is great. He's fantastic. He literally is a generational talent. And it's so funny to like think like again going back to that Bears game that Mitch Trubisky was drafted over him isn't that going to be like one of those historic like draft moments that we look back on and just think wow really this happened uh, oh I yeah think, it's like Michael Jordan not going first overall right yeah I mean Michael Jordan that is a great comparison because he's already won an MVP in his second season mm-hmm. he's in the Super Bowl in his third season what what more is this guy going to do? Because <laughs> newsflash, he's probably going to play for close to almost 20 more years. Can you imagine what 20 more years of this is going to look like? What kind of numbers will he finish with? Will he just destroy every single record that we currently have on the books? Mm-hmm. We just got through celebrating Drew Brees passing the all-time touchdown mark. Well, in 10 years, are we going to see Patrick Mahomes break that? Because when you just consider pace alone, barring injury, there's no way that he's not going to su- supplant every single record we currently have on the books. Yeah. I mean, no, he's, he's outstanding, and he doesn't run the risk that some of these other young quarterbacks do, right? Like, everybody always talks about the scrambling athletic quarterbacks, which Pat Mahomes is still athletic, right, without a doubt. But everybody's talking about the Lamar Jackson, right, that gets out of the pocket and runs and uses his own feet. But those quarterbacks tend to not last as long, right? And we've seen RG3 get injured, and we've seen several other quarterbacks, right? Tim Tebow didn't have the success that people thought he would. Um, But Pat Mahomes, like, he has the ability to run if he needs to, but he could just stand in the pocket and throw for 60 yards or 70 yards on, on every single play if he wants, right? Like, just the amount of arm strength that he has combined with the speed that he can throw the ball at and the accuracy And even just his creativeness, right? Like we've seen these weird, strange, like behind the back passes, right? Or I'm going to throw it underhand or use my offhand and still be able to hit it. Like Pat Mahomes really is a generational talent. Yeah, his ability to improvise is what sets him over the top. I think what's going to determine how good his career ends up is eventually he's going to lose that fastball. Like there's no way you could throw it like 60 yards when you start gaining into those upper 30s, 40s. Like Tom Brady, for as great as he's been, as great as his peaks have been, we've started mm-hmm. to notice that tail off, that decline. It happens. It It's just part of the game. So his ability to learn those secondary pitches, and I think he's got a great coach to do it with. If he has Andy Reid there, or let's say Eric Bieniemy supplants Andy Reid as the coach at one point, it's a great like foundation to build your house on, build a great quarterback's career on. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, we always talk about like where these talents like end up. If who knows how good Patrick Mahomes would have been if he went to a Bears team or, you know, one of these other garbage franchises like the Browns. But the fact that he went to Kansas City that was already building a good culture with what Alex Smith was doing, what Andy Reid was doing, was fantastic for his career. I, I think he couldn't be any more grateful for everything that came out. I was hearing people talk about kind of like the tape coming out on him. He wasn't even the most Mm -hmm. polished guy coming out of Texas Tech. It was just a matter of recognizing the ability, the talent was there. People are going to bring it up, but his dad's a pro athlete too, so I'm sure that helps him kind of understand what the the little minutiae of the day-to-day operations to be able to get in peak 
physical condition. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because a lot of people are going to mention that Brett Favre comparison. We never got a chance to really take in prime Brett Favre. We saw some good years, you know, that those years with Minnesota, the tail end of his career. But when people talk about Brett Favre's legacy, like it's really happened in the nineties. And obviously you and I were in diapers at that point. So we didn't really get a chance to really take in mm -hmm. the like greatness that was. So being able to watch Patrick Mahomes, it, it's truly, he's going to be one of those guys, like again, going back to Kobe Bryant, how like players fill in, who's your favorite athlete to watch? That's going to be Patrick Mahomes. Mm -hmm. Like regardless of who your favorite team is, you don't even have to be a Chiefs fan. I'm a Niners fan and I love watching Patrick Mahomes play. I'll be honest. That's why it's a little bit tough to watch this game. Of course, I'm going to be cheering hard for the Niners, but I like Patrick Mahomes. I really do. I think the world of this guy. And that's why, like, again, I had them 14 and two. I think you still had them with 12 and four yourself. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take a little credit. I still had them in the Super Bowl. Had them in the Super Bowl in the preseason. Had them winning the Super Bowl in my midseason update. Yeah. I'm going to welch on that a little bit just because I can't, <laughs> I can't pick against my team. Spoiler alert here. <laughs> but, you know, with that said, like, I've been on them all year, and I got to give credit. It's just a talented team. Like, I look top to bottom, and the two best teams made the Super Bowl in my mind. That's what I think. Yeah, I mean, they're really, they really are talented. Now, you can argue, again, the talent for Lamar Jackson and, and the Ravens, right? But we saw that they break down when it comes to the postseason, that they're just not able to get it done. And – there's still a lot, right, to dissect with that. Like, was it appropriate to rest the starters in that final game against Pittsburgh, right? Even, even if it didn't mean anything to you, right? Like, was that too long of a buy to basically give them? Who knows, right? But that would be the only real argument is maybe Baltimore, at least during the regular season, might have looked to be more talented. But you're right. I think the two best teams ended up making it. Um, the Saints, obviously, they, they weren't able to get it done in the NFC. And they even had their struggles. And so I'm excited for the 49ers and the Chiefs. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the Ravens, I think they were just really the hottest team, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were the, necessarily the most talented team because when I compare Lamar to Patrick Mahomes, let's face it, you mentioned Patrick Mahomes' arm talent. I think the important thing that we got to always remember with the quarterback position, and we always lose track of it every time we have this shiny new toy like a Lamar Jackson, you have to throw the ball first. Yeah, you throw the ball first, you run second. Thankful, thankfully for Patrick Mahomes, he could do both. For Lamar, he's gotten better as a passer, but he's not nearly close to the level Patrick Mahomes is at. Mm -hmm. Like, no, no joke. And it, I'm not trying to diss him. It's just no one else is close to Patrick Mahomes right yeah. now. Can you name and another quarterback that's even on, on the same level? Like no, are, right? Like, like you could have maybe have said Aaron Rodgers at one point in his career, but we saw this year that Aaron Rodgers is nowhere near close, right? Like, not anymore anyways. Uh, I, I don't know if it's an age thing. I don't know if it's a mental thing. But Aaron Rodgers is not that quarterback anymore. Tom Brady is obviously old, and I don't even know if Tom Brady ever was quite at that level. Um, so, yeah, and Lamar Jackson, as good of an athlete as he is and as much as he's learned and developed as a, you know, as an individual, as a quarterback, I just don't think that there's a way that you can teach the talent that Patrick Mahomes has, right? Like you cannot teach somebody to start playing like Pat Mahomes as much as, you know, even if Andy Reid took you and I, right. And spent day and night with me and you, there's just no way we could do the things that Pat Mahomes does. Yeah. I think in many ways, Patrick Mahomes is kind of bad for the game because a lot of young aspiring quarterbacks are going to learn like from watching Patrick Mahomes. And there are some poor fundamentals in there. Please don't do the sideways throws, the no-hook throws, oh, because yeah. Patrick Mahomes can do that. He can get away with it, but don't mm -hmm. get cute. <laughs> you still have to do the game fundamentally first before you can get at that level. Granted, he's doing it in the pros, so like it's even more ridiculous because you're doing this against the best athletes, the best defenders at their positions. Mm -hmm. That's just an example of his greatness. and who knows what's next for the guy. I mean, again, personally, I hope he loses the Super Bowl, but it's only because he's probably going to be in the next five Super Bowls, or at least it feels like at this rate. Because seriously, yeah. who, who else in the AFC is going to step up to the Chiefs? 
Yeah, and that's the thing right now, right? Is like the Steelers, they sort of had, like, I don't know if you could call it a dynasty because we never got the wins out of it, right? But they're starting to get old. We haven't found, you know, a quarterback that can replace Big Ben. And Big Ben's value has started to taper off, and he's not the quarterback he was. So the Steelers, as tough as they are every single year, I don't think that they can. Baltimore, we've seen that as of right now, they can't get it done in the postseason, even if, you know, Lamar Jackson continues to develop. Um, the New England Patriots, it sort of feels like it's the end of their dynasty. And I know we say every single year, right? But like this year it actually really does feel like, hey, maybe it really is coming to an end, right? Like you've got Tom Brady. I think he posted some cryptic tweet of him walking out of Gillette Stadium, right, with his back turned <laughs> or something like that, right? And so it sort of seems like, hey, maybe it's sort of the end of, of the New England Patriots. And then, like, there's a lot of other teams that, you know, really aren't even worth mentioning when it comes to the AFC that, like, is there any other top teams? Like, maybe the Titans, right? Like, if they can continue this. But, like, even them, like, they're sort of Derrick Henry reliant at the moment, right? Like, mm -hmm. they, they weren't really, like, doing anything else outstanding except you have this gigantic running back that, makes men look like little boys, right? And if they don't have him, do they have the success that they have? I don't think so. Um, the Texans, they always just feel like they're still always going to be one or two pieces away from having that complete dominant team, you know? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Dre, aren't you questioning a franchise, an organization that named their head coach, their GM, after giving up one of the biggest postseason leads in NFL history? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying that I don't know how great of a move that it was, right? Uh, and that's just the thing is, like like I said, the Texans have just never felt like they're the team, right? Like they feel like a very good team, um, especially with the team that they've got. You know, they got Watt uh, and, and, you know, Watson and all that, but then like Hopkins, but they never feel like, oh, that's that's the Super Bowl pick, right? Like guaranteed Super Bowl, like it's going to be them. They just never feel like that. And I don't know if there's anything that they can do at the moment that I would like really make me change my position on them. So uh, it's a long way of saying, yeah, Juju, I think you're right. Like the Kansas City Chiefs, if they can continue to keep, you know, this level of, of talent around their team, right? And granted, it's going to be hard when these guys have to get paid and when they're coming up on contract renewals. But if they can continue to do so uh, and find good ways to find steals in the draft and, and stuff like that, make good trades, Kansas City Chiefs can can run the AFC for a long time. All right. Well, you know, we talked about the Niners. We talked about the Chiefs. Who's going to run the NFC? Who's going to run the AFC? Who's going to run Super Bowl Sunday? Because right now, the Chiefs are the favorite. I believe as of today, they are a one-and-a-half point favorite going into the Super Bowl matchup. I mean, I – I've said it. I'm going to go with my Niners. I picked the Chiefs at the midseason ranks, and I've been on them all year. But I, I, just personal reasons, I'm not going to go against my Niners. If I lose this weekend, it is what it is. But, I mean, I, I think objectively I do have to say the Chiefs are an amazing offense. I, I haven't seen an offense as good as the Chiefs in my lifetime. Except, well, except maybe like the 2007 pass, but that's only – close offense I can even realistically put in the same ballpark and I think what's going to come down to is I think the Niners are balanced on both sides of the ball I think let's face it if the Chiefs beat the Niners it's going to be because that offense was amazing that Patrick Mahomes led team was what gave them the victory the Niners what there's several ways they could win this game if you told me that Jimmy G popped off and had 300 yards, three touchdowns, I'd believe you. If you told me Raheem Mostert, Breida, Coleman combined for over 250 rushing yards and three touchdowns, I'd believe you. If you told me the defense locked down, shut down Patrick Mahomes, kept him in the pocket somehow, and Bosa and a bunch of the linemen combined for about five sacks and maybe they got a pick in there, I'd believe you. And that's why I'm going to go with the Niners. Because I think there's multiple ways to get it done, multiple ways to skin a cat for them in this matchup. And I think that's what's going to be the difference maker. Yeah. I, so I'm going to agree with you. I think, you know, the more that I look at it, the 49ers are going to win this game. And my reason mostly being is one, 
we've seen that the Kansas City Chiefs have sort of been starting off a little bit slow in their past few games, right? So they were down versus the Titans for a little bit. They're down obviously big against uh, uh, the Houston Texans. And those are teams that don't have as good a defense as San Francisco, right? So San Francisco right now has the number one defense across many of the stats, right? So they're, they're you know, yards per game, you know, they're, they're you know, total yardage, like of all this stuff. San Francisco is just really good on defense. So one, if Kansas City Chiefs continue to fall behind like they do in the first quarter sometimes, San Fran has the ability to hold them back a little bit more than some of these other teams. It doesn't mean they're going to 100% contain Pat Mahomes. I just don't know if that's necessarily even possible. But their defense has the, the tools and the techniques and the ability to slow them down a little bit more than some of the other teams. Uh, also, you know, we talked about rushing, right? And the more that you rush, right, you're eating off the clock. And that, that gives Pat Mahomes less time being on the field. Well, right now, you know, San Francisco's number one for rushing as well. So they've got a really good rushing game um, that, you know, they the combination of their defense and their rush means that Pat Mahomes is going to have less time on the field, less time to make some drives, less time to make, make things happen. And so with all that, and, you know, like you said, the other way that they can skin a cat is if they really need, you know, if they really need to rely on their passing game, Jimmy G, like, he's proven time and time again that, hey, I can still do it, right? Like, he hasn't had to very many times this season, but in the few games that he has had to pull it out, like, he can do that for his team. And the combination of all those things, I think Kansas City, they truly are talented. We know that they're outstanding. We know their offense is going to be dangerous. But I think the 49ers have, have the tools to be able to slow them down or keep their offense off the field and be able to keep up just a little bit when they're on offense. You know what this kind of remind me of, at least some similarities. So obviously we compare Patrick Mahomes a lot to Brett Favre, right? Mm -hmm. You have a Shanahan as head coach in this one. It reminds me of the first time that John Alway and the Broncos got to the Super Bowl with, um, led by Shanahan. They played the Packers and they ended up winning that game. You had the young superstar quarterback, yeah, again, this, like, great rushing attack led by Terrell Davis. Mm -hmm. I, it, it's funny how history repeats itself. When you even look at Andy Reid, so Andy Reid comes from the Mike Holgram coaching tree. Mike Holgram was the coach of the Green Bay Packers in that game. Mm -hmm. it, it's funny how history repeats itself sometimes. And I thought that was a fun narrative that came up. I, I think that it just – let's go through this position by position real quick. Yeah. So let's say – so, like – Kickers. <laughs> we'll start with kickers. Robbie Gold, Harrison Bucker. Mm, edge, kind of wash. I don't care about kickers. Whatever. Moving on. <laughs> Maybe gold. At least, yeah, I would say probably gold. Yeah, it's a bigger contract. Whatever. Yeah. You know, defensive back, and this is going to be where the Chiefs make their money. So do you believe more in the defensive backs of the Niners or the Chiefs? So you figure, you know, you're, again, a unit led by – Honey Badger versus that Richard Sherman, Chiquisky Tart, Emmanuel Mosley led team. You know they're weak on one side. It's just going to be can they keep up with the Chiefs wide receivers? Mm -hmm. I mean, I give the edge to the Niners, but slightly. Slight. All right, linebacker. I think there's no question here. I mean, no offense to the Raglan, Hitchens, all those guys, but I think Fred Warner, Greenlaw, Quan Alexander coming off that pec injury. It's a mm -hmm. clear advantage for the Niners there. Defensive line, again, obvious advantage. Like, yeah, obvious advantage to the Niners just because when you go down that list, it, you literally had to have a whole line composed of first rounders. Mm -hmm. Number seventeen, Eric Armstead led the team in sacks. Nick Bosa, rookie of the year. D Ford off the edge. Going to be a fun narrative in this game. Again, he was what cost the Chiefs their Super Bowl appearance last year with that offsides penalty that Frank Clark, who's on the Chiefs defensive side, called inexcusable, and he made it a point to bring that up again in the Super Bowl lead-up. Mm -hmm. So we'll see if uh, D. Ford can have a redemption moment. But, I mean, clearly, Niners have the advantage there. Okay, well, let's go offensive line. I think it's about a wash, personally. I think the Chiefs do a great job of keeping Patrick Mahomes on his feet. Yep. I do think that the Niners, they have – part of the reason they're so good in the running game – is what, how active of blockers these guys have because they don't just sit on their ass. 
they're blocking downfield. They get out there. They're leading the charge on screens. Uh, McGlinchey, Staley, all those guys really come together well and make that zone blocking scheme work. Mm -hmm. So I think that's about a wash. You have two really good units for both teams. And that's why, again, their offenses are as good as they are. Wide mm -hmm. receivers, clearly the Chiefs. I mean, I love Debo Samuel. I love Emmanuel Sanders. But come on, Tyree Kill, Tyree Kill. Martin, yeah. Sammy Watkins is the worst wide receiver on this team. And he was a first round premium talent coming out of Clemson himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just an elite unit. Here's where we get a fun one. Kelsey versus Kittle. The tight end units. Oof. I'll let you lead this one. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's going to be a wash for me. Let me do some quick research while you uh, filibuster for me. But I, <laughs> I would almost call that a wash, right? Like, we know that there's a holy trinity when it comes to tight ends, especially from, like, a fantasy perspective, but just from, like, an overall production value and – Right now, they're both, like, fantastic. They're both big-body dudes that can get you a reception when you need it and be able to score, you know, a passing touchdown for you. So, uh, Or, well, I guess for them, a receiving touchdown, but you get, get a passing touchdown out of it, right? Well, um, what gives Kittle, like, a huge advantage is what he does as a blocker. Like, he is one, that of, the most, he is one of the most active blockers, like, you, you can get in the running game, and he abuses defensive linemen. Like, he makes them legitimately look bad. He was blocking – Eric Kendricks and um, Everson Griffin the other week, uh, Daniil Hunter, all these guys. And these guys are no joke. These are all pros, and he was making them look bad against Minnesota. So that's one, what his advantage is. But when you consider Travis Kelsey in a third and 10 situation, his route running, he's just the ultimate security blanket for Patrick Mahomes. And more than just that, he's a red zone all-star. Like, he is Gronk in the sense of what he does in the red zone. Like, he's always a scoring threat. You always want to know where Kelsey is when you're in the 20s. And I think that's one where his advantage is. Again, going back to Kittle, he makes his pay, like, with what he does with the speed. He's one of the fastest tight ends in the game. They're both, like, amazing, honestly. No, they're, they're both fantastic. And so to give you just, a, you know, a little bit of stats behind them, right, when it comes to receptions, there's a slight difference. So Kelsey leads in receptions, which makes sense just because of the offense that they run, right, with Pat Mahomes. But it's only 97 receptions this season to 85 uh, in favor of Kelsey. Targets, he gets 136 compared to 107, right? So Kelsey leads and, and targets him. Most of the receiving stats, right, are going to go Kelsey's way. He's got uh, 1,229 yards, right, um, whereas Kittle only has 1,053. Uh, but still, they both have five touchdowns. Uh, rushing, though, is K Kittle does a little bit more rushing, which, you know, they're, like I said, big body tight ends, but he's got 22 rushing yards, which isn't, like, Outstanding. Yeah, no, it's just because of what Kyle Shanahan will scheme up sometimes. Like, he'll mm -hmm. legitimately do an end around with a tight end, which he's only able to do because of how fast Kittle is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, no, they're very, they're very even, right? And they both, I think they both benefit from playing in the systems that they play in, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, fullback, you can go really give that to the Niners, Kyle Juszczyk, what he does, again, mm -hmm. as a blocker, as an offensive weapon. Not, the Chiefs don't really have a great comparison there. And then we get into, of course, the quarterback conversation, which is going to be what's going to make or break the difference. Now, the national narrative right now is Jimmy G, can he get it done? Is he just a game manager? What is with this guy? Only eight pass attempts against the Packers. Listen, guys, I've seen him do it throughout the year. When I went through that review of their entire season, I mentioned like three or four games in which he led them to those victories. I mean, he is whatever the moment ask him to be. And I yeah. think that's all you need from a quarterback. With that said, I mean, I'm not an idiot. <laughs> I'm going to give it to Patrick Mahomes because the guy's a, just so far above like everyone else. It's Patrick Mahomes in literally every other quarterback at this point. If you mm -hmm. were to tell me we have a quarterback draft today for – regardless of for how long, one year, their entire career, it's Patrick Mahomes. It begins and ends with Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Pat Mahomes, 
And the thing is, is the quarterback position is so important too, right? Like you almost get double points for having that one be better, but still. So I think, you know, we've gone through basically their entire lineups, right? And, and their entire rosters. Running back. And we forgot running back. Oh, running back too. Yeah, we forgot I mean, running back. Running back, you would definitely give it to the Niners here. I mean, no offense to the ghost of Shady McCoy. Mm-hmm. Daryl Williams, Damian Williams, but I mean, we've seen what Moster, we've seen what Breida have done. We've seen what Tevin Coleman has been able to do, even coming in with the dislocated shoulder that they just literally had to pop back into place. You know all about that. Yep. So, I mean, that's clearly an advantage towards the Niners. We'll see how much the run game comes into play. Again, going back to the quarterbacks, because that's, again, where the main story is, where the main narrative is. It's just Patrick Mahomes is a league above Jimmy right now, and whether Jimmy will ever ascend to that level, whether he'll be 2016 Matt Ryan is yet to be seen. But right now, he's an ass to be. He's an ass to be because the team around him is built in a way that, like, if you told me that they ran 30 times a game, that's fine. That's what Kyle Shanahan wants to do. And if they're running 30 times a game, I doubt they're averaging two yards per carry. I think they're doing pretty well for themselves. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of the argument against Aaron Rodgers or, you know, however you want to view it has been that as good as Aaron Rodgers was, they didn't have anything else to rely on. Right. So they were never able to get a whole lot of win with Green Bay. And as a result, they haven't gotten all the rings that a lot of people think Aaron Rodgers probably should have gotten them. Um, And so it's like, hey, well, now we don't need to rely just on a quarterback. Right. Like so those franchises that are just tethered to having good quarterback play if you can break off that, that's almost better for your franchise and that we know that we can do it if we need to, but we don't have to rely on that. So why do we? Now here's, I, I guess, a ne- the next thing. So we mentioned that a quarterback is almost like a plus two. What about for coaches? Because what's followed around Andy Reid his entire career is the inability to get it done. He's got, he's played in almost 20 or not played, but coached in almost like 28 playoff games or something off the top of my head. I don't know that exact number. And he has zero Super Bowl rings to account for it. He has the one Super Bowl appearance where they lost to the Patriots in 2004, 2004, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So like that's a long distant memory at this point. And the last time, and you know, when they were down 24 points to the Texans, like I said, people were just thinking, Oh great. Here we go again. Right. Andy Reid choking in the playoffs. It's just bound to happen. We had another fantastic regular season, but I guess this is what it comes down to. And then when you look at Kyle Shanahan, so the last time we saw Kyle Shanahan in a Super Bowl, they were leading 28-3. to And then the walls came crashing in, and Tom Brady led another historic Patriots moment. Tommy Terrific wins his, well, let's see, fifth ring at that point. Mm-hmm. so I mean that's one of the things against him and with Kyle what's followed his career is this team was bad before this year like I said he had won uh, 10 games in total between the first two years with the Niners mm-hmm. four games last year with Jimmy Hurt six games the previous year and before Jimmy got there they were only had one win so I, again it speaks to the Garoppolo because without him in the starting lineup this team has only won like a handful of games but for Kyle like we see what he's doing from a scheming perspective but I mean it's just going to be can he translate that into a game against another adequate play caller another dynamic offensive mind like Andy Reid yeah now I mean I think they're again, like very evenly matched, right? Like we've seen that these guys can be extremely good coaches, right? But they just haven't been able to get it done at the the highest of the highest levels, right? But now we're going to get to see one of them, you know, one of them's going to get to do it. And I don't think that that'll be necessarily an indictment, right? Like, for instance, if Andy Reid doesn't get the win here, I'm not going to say like, I'm not going to be calling for his head saying he needs to get fired. Um, but, right, like it'll show again just another time where he hasn't been able to get it done when it comes to, to the big game. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I think I'm going to give the edge to Shanahan for what he's been able to do with all the pieces and the different schemes, right, the different ways that he's been able to win. Whereas Reed has really been able to win because, you know, they're so great offensively. 
Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to give a slight nod to Shanahan. What about yeah. you? I mean, it definitely does fill with Andy Reid when you do coach a generational talent like a Patrick Mahomes. We always think to Phil Jackson coaching Kobe or Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. Like, how much do you really have to do when you have this great talent behind him? But obviously, he was a big impact in why Patrick Mahomes is the way he is. Yeah, absolutely. And he's been doing it consistently for 20 years. Like, Andy Reid's, like, worst year is still, I want to say, at minimum 500. So mm-hmm. I think that speaks to just how good of a coach. Andy truly is I think what I'm going to give it to Shanahan but barely um, because I do think it's impressive what Shanahan's been able to do so obviously this is his first head coaching job he's had in the league Mm -hmm. but he made Cleveland a great offense he made the Texans a good offense he again made the Falcons an amazing offense a historic offense to get him to the Super Bowl that year and now he's doing it again with the Niners. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> if you're the Browns, you want to know why the Browns let him go? Apparently because he didn't agree on jo- starting Johnny Manziel. How do you think they feel about that? <laughs> but I, yeah, that's just petty in my opinion. And that's telling me you don't trust your coach, but hey. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, <laughs> that's kind of like shows like, except in the right situation. Here's the thing though. It it's a, would be a bigger win for Andy at this point in his career. Let's mm-hmm. face it, Andy's older. Kyle Shanahan's still in his 40s. So if he lost this one, the Niners were ahead of schedule anyway. No yep. one saw them in the Super Bowl this year. And if they won it, it would be a great like notch in his belt. But for Andy, it's the difference between being a Hall of Famer and a Hall of Very Good. Mm-hmm. So I, I do think that that's going to be a bigger impact in this game. Who so you 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 said you're going to the Niners? I'm going with the Niners. Um, one and a half point line doesn't really leave you much margin there. Yeah, but either way, so I mean, hey, let's just do some quick <laughs> prop bets here. So before we go on, mm-hmm. so Demi Lovato, uh, New Mexico's own, is going to be singing the uh, national anthem. Will she or won't she go over under two minutes? The average time to sing the national anthem is one minute fifty seven seconds. I'll take the over. You'll take the over. You think she'll mm-hmm. get carry her on that the land of the free. Get really hit that high free. note and just keep that going. And the home of the brave. All right, and we're so really getting pa- we're really getting patriotic here at the <laughs> I know, man. You gotta gotta sing it proudly. Okay, let's see here. Other fun ones here. Okay. Let's say this. Um, over, under 300 passing yards for Jimmy Garoppolo. Under. I think they're going to rely more on the rushing game. Okay. I mean, you've already said the Niners are going to win. Mm-hmm. With that said, who's your Super Bowl MVP? Super Bowl MVP? <sighs> I think it's going to be... Hmm. I want to go with one of the defensive players, but it's just like, which defensive player? But it's hard. I don't, I don't ever really see defensive players get it much. Mm. Um, I guess I'll go with Jimmy G. Even though I said that he won't have as many passing yards just due to the run game, but I'll go with Jimmy G. Yeah, it's interesting. I think what would be the difference maker between a defensive player winning the MVP would be for, a de- let's say it's Nick Bosa, right? I think he would have to have multiple sacks in that game. And mm-hmm. if it's like Sherman, I think he would have to have like a pick six. So I think you're right. If I'm going to pick the Niners, I guess I'd have to go Jimmy G just based off, you know, history. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's see here. Let's see here. Mm-mm-mm-mm. The money line. Ah, over under 54 and a half points for this game. Feels a little low. I'm going to pick the over there. I mean, just. Yeah, between these two franchises, uh, I will also take the over. Yeah, I mean, realist, so if we had to name a final score, that's just something we just we generally don't do. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to go 28-24. Uh, I was also thinking something along those lines. Let me see. Would that be yeah. over? I don't, I don't, uh, <laughs> quick math there. I said the over. What's no, it? that'd be 52 points. <laughs> oh, okay. So I, I got I to gotta round up here. Um, let's yeah. see here. 
let me go change that to the 3124 then to match take, that. not contradict myself i'll take uh 3528 3528 okay okay so apparently it's like 100 to 1 odds that Kyle Shanahan would blow another 28 to 3 lead he gets unfair criticism on that one man i got to tell you yeah. let's be real about that like okay yeah the offense made some poor play calling but you still allowed a 25 point lead to slip away on defense come on yeah yeah exactly right is that you know as good as the offense was if your defense is going to let that lead dissipate like what can you do i saw a good one who is alex smith cheering for on the game day oh probably the chiefs is who i would bet yeah, I do feel like his end with the Niners got a little bit more ugly. Jim Harbaugh cutting him for uh, – well, trading him away for, to let Colin Kaepernick take over. Yeah. You know, it's funny, like, um, you know, a man from high school, like, you know, big-time Chiefs fan, like, we um, constantly used to go back and forth over the merits of Alex Smith versus Colin Kaepernick, and here we are almost six years later, and obviously our two franchises are in the Super Bowl. So if you mm-hmm. seem to get any passionate Facebook debates – that's the backstory on that one. Man, <laughs> it's funny. We, we went from a whole thing earlier. We had obviously give a big morium to Kobe. Here we are in the Super Bowl. It's 25th episode for us. So, I mean, yeah, hey, what, it, what is that? The silver like one? Silver anniversary? I think so. Yeah. 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 Like okay. Gotcha. I, I expect my uh, fine China in the mail shortly, Dre. Oh, I've got something even better than that for you. <laughs> okay. I want to give a quick shout out to one of our newest like um, partners that we're going to be bringing on board to kind of like some browser media team. So the face off puck pot. So they're going to be doing some NHL power rankings for us now moving forward. And I thought I'd just give them a little shout out here at the end. Mm-hmm. Separate. They have their own YouTube channel. Go look them up. Subscribe to them. Of course, subscribe to us first because we're your preferred sports media destination but check out their power rankings they're going to be going up after the super bowl because let's face it everyone on super bowl sunday is going to be involved in super bowl sunday Mm -hmm. um smart guys really know their stuff i think they're going to add another dynamic all the people have been showing us a lot of instagram support recently too like our followers have really jumped up high over the last few weeks i think we picked up almost a couple hundred followers in just like the past three weeks which it's impressive. I thank you guys. We appreciate the support. Keep listening. Obviously, we got some great shows. We released the Get Your Popcorn for the Aaron Hernandez documentary. We um, released some great reaction videos to Gridiron Heights, the Kobe, like tribute, best of Kobe moments. And hey, we're not stopping. We got some more shows to come. Dre, you want to give a little shout out to the listeners here? Yeah, absolutely. No, we appreciate all that you guys are doing, right? Like we've been posting several memes and updates on on Twitter, right? And Instagram and people are loving it, right? Like you said, we've got several hundred followers that have just added us in this past few weeks. So we appreciate it, right? Um, it's, you know, love for sports, love for the game. Uh, and again, just shout out to all the Kobe fans out there, uh, Laker fans and, you know, all those families involved in playing crash. So we, uh, we know that it's been a little bit of a rough time, a r- little bit of a rough week for the sports world. Um, but we appreciate you listening. We appreciate all that, all of our listeners and fans, uh, all the support they give us. All right, Trey. So I got two more days till Super Bowl Sunday. If you don't hear from me on Monday morning, either one of two things happened. I celebrated too hard and I went missing, or I went so far into a deep depression that I went missing. But either way, please send out a a search unit for me if you don't hear from me shortly following that whatever happens all right guys it's been a great show we'll see you next time remember like comment subscribe peace